you, you guys have control over the volume in the back? Or I'll put stand over here. Yeah, the volume is too high. Uh, yeah. Oh, you can adjust it from there. Yeah. Okay, good. So, and uh, also the lighting can be. Oh, good. Uh, okay. Lecture mode. I just please come. I just ah, I see. Okay, cool. It's too high. Yeah, it's maybe. Yeah, let's do that. That seems good. That seems good. Okay. Yeah. So, I can't fix the slide. I tried to figure out how to fix the slides getting yeah, caught yeah, off the bottom, yeah, but that seems yeah. impossible. Okay, you guys want to get started? What do you want to do? Uh, you think? Uh, okay. Yeah, All right. All right, we'll get started then. So, let me turn this down even more. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. Okay? Sort of. All right, so. Okay, now I think I'm in no danger of being too hot in this room. So I'm shivering a little bit, but that's fine. Okay, so this is um, this is how I ended uh, my last talk, which was kind of all about atoms and atom gases. And a couple uh, important takeaway points were that when we shine light on um, a bunch of atoms, we can induce a potential energy shift, which is proportional to the intensity. Okay, so that's going to be kind of important. And that there's also an interaction between atoms, and that um, can be characterized for pi uh, h bar squared over m a as a contact potential. Okay, so those are two takeaway points. All right, so um, what I want to do now is go on and move towards how do we make disorder in these ultra cold gases. Okay, so that's the next talk. The last talk, which I'll give tomorrow before I have to drive off to the airport, is um, once we have disordered gases, what kind of localization phenomena do we see? Okay, so that's the last <clears throat> three talks, which will be tomorrow. But right now, it's just how do we make disorder? And I am going to dig into a little bit of nitty gritty here because I think, again, it's kind of important. But if we get too bogged down on it, we can skip over it and do some other things too. All right, and we're kind of behind on the schedule, so I'll pay attention to that as well and try to not talk for too long. All right, so in ultra-cold atom gas experiments, there are a few ways that disorder has been created in the past. Three of these um, involve optical dipole potentials, optical speckle, what's called projected disorder, and incommensurate lattices. And there's been one group that's done experiments with impurity disorder, and I'll tell you about that too. So this is kind of what I'll cover today. And one thing I should say is that um, this lecture and the next lecture are not exhaustive. So I picked out a bunch of examples to show you. This lecture is still kind of pedagogical. The next lecture will be in a really big sweeping overview. So there's a lot I'm leaving out. And there's a lot of people's work I'm leaving out as well. All right, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is optical speckle. Um, it's something you see every day, whether you realize it or not. If, what I'm going to do is I'm going to Assume you know a little bit of Fourier optics, but I'll tell you what I mean by certain terms and ideas. If you want to learn more, there's two great books. There's a whole book on optical speckle you can read by Goodman. If you want to learn more about optics, and especially Fourier optics, which are sort of essential to understanding uh, speckle, you can read his book on Fourier optics. All right. Both are good books. Speckle is also an ongoing research topic, so there's a huge amount of information in articles. All right, so what is optical speckle? Usually I bring a demo of optical speckle. I forgot, but I have some pictures up here for you. So optical speckle, how do you make it? You take a laser beam. Actually, in my lab, we use a laser beam that's this color green, and you shine it through an optical diffuser. The diffuser is kind of like a dirty piece of plastic, which has a randomly varying thickness, Okay, just like I drew there. And of course, it's made out of some material, which is fairly transparent. It has an index of refraction n. All right, which is not one. So the electric field of light goes through this diffuser and comes out on the other side with a bunch of random phases, which come from going through different lengths of material with an index of refraction n. All right, so now this electric field is a bunch of random phases that are spatially varying and printed on it on the other side of this diffuser. If you take that light, oh, let me also say the phase gradients here give an additional divergence to the laser beam 
because they act like little lenses which deflect the light. If you let that light go off to the wall, so the demo I usually bring here is exactly that. I take a, up the diffuser using my lab and I shoot a laser beam through it. What you would see is you'd see this funny random intensity pattern, and that's an optical speckle field. Where that comes from is because this electric field has all these random phases imprinted on it, and if you think about using Huygens' principle to propagate that off into the far field to the wall, <coughs> Each one of the little places on here acts like another source of light. They all go off to the wall and they interfere with these random phases and you get this random intensity pattern. Now, what Fourier optics tells you is actually that random intensity pattern really just comes from the fact that the optical field, the electric field and the far field, far away from the source, is just a Fourier transform of what you had in the near field or where you put that diffuser in, okay? So, those random phases through that Fourier transform turn into these random intensities, okay? And that random intensity laser field, that optical speckle field, that's what that is, has random varying intensity in space, and we're gonna use that to create disorder with the atoms. My and many other groups use that to create disorder in the atoms because the atoms experience a potential through the AC Stark shift, which is proportional to that light. And so now that varies around in space. Okay, so that's the basic way my group and many other groups make these optical speckle fields. So let me tell you, let's dig a bit, a little bit more into this. Okay, so in experiments, of course, we have these atoms are in this vacuum system, so we can't just take a laser beam and propagate it to the wall. So we take that laser beam, we pass it through that diffuser, and we focus it with a lens, focal length F, diameter D. And that lens, what Fourier optics teaches you, is that lens brings the far field to the near field to the focal plane of that lens. So now at that focal plane of that lens, we have the Fourier transform of that random set of phases, which again makes a random set of intensities. Okay, and then we always work with these Gaussian laser beam profiles, which is why I introduced this earlier, with some beam waste W0. Of course, that speckle field has an, an overall envelope, which is set just by geometrical, by uh, <coughs> physical optics. It also has a Gaussian envelope. And those formulas I put on the earlier slide will tell you how to calculate that envelope. In this case, it's, it's usually just dominated. We work in a regime where that envelope is dominated by the extra divergence, which is added in by the, fa by the uh, phase gradients that show up on this laser beam because this is uh, varying in space, the thickness. Okay, and in fact, around that focal plane, and what's called the paraxial limit, which is not exactly satisfied in experiments, that means all the angles of the light are small, which they're not because we use powerful lenses in experiments. Around that focal plane, you get, at the focal plane, you get the Fourier transform of the electric field. Around it, you'll get what's called the Fresnel transform. So you take the Fourier transform of the electric field right after the diffuser times a factor that depends on how far you're away from the focus. Okay, so that's actually the electric field, and you square that to get the intensity. All right, so that's how we get this random laser beam onto the atoms. Any questions about that so far? Okay, now I'm going to dig in even a little bit deeper to this and tell you more about this random light field. So, as I was saying, through the optical dipole effect, the AC Stark effect, the atoms feel potential proportional to the intensity. So that intensity just turns into a random potential. It's continuous random potential. And most experiments work with blue detuning, so that detuning delta, which is a difference in frequency between the laser and the atomic resonance, is positive, so it's a repulsive potential. All right, so regions of high intensity are large positive potential. potential. Regions that are dark in that speckle field are zero potential. Okay? All right, so what are some characteristics of this potential? Oh, let me also just say, in most of the AMO experiments, people have a disorder strength, which we call delta, which is really just the average value of that potential. And I'll tell you more about how to think about that. Um, that average value, it turns out because the properties of speckle also happens to be related to the standard deviation of um, potential energies which are present. And I'll show you that in a minute. Because this is also proportional to the, the average of the intensity of the light. Okay, so um, in certain approximations we can make, we can discuss statistical measures of the speckle, which will tell us things like the distribution of intensities, as well as the some kind of characteristic length scale that's present. 
Because if you look at that, you can tell with your eye there's some kind of length scale there. So how do we be precise about that? So we can make some approximations. We can say that, let's say this diffuser has a spatially uncorrelated um, set of thicknesses, which leads to spatially uncorrelated random phases that fully sample 0 to 2 pi. And let's assume for the time being a uniformly illuminated lens, which is not physical, but it allows us to calculate certain things easily. So that means that I don't have a, let's, well, I'm going to show you a few formula over the next couple slides where I assume there's not a Gaussian laser beam profile here anymore, but it's uniformly illuminated with a uniform intensity, which is not physical, and this is rather important, but it's useful because I can write down formulas. Okay, so sorry it's cut off. I could not find a way, and I didn't have time to fix the slides. So assuming these things, we can make simple statistical <laughs> properties that tell us about the intensity distribution and length scales present. Okay, so the first thing you can, you can show is that the distribution of intensities that are present are exponential. There's a well-defined average, and it's an exponential probability distribution. So that means that that disorder energy, which is the average value, so okay, to back up a minute, that means that the sort of uh, variance present for an exponential distribution like this is also basically proportional to the average intensity. So if I make the disorder um, energy equal to the uh, average dipole potential, which is proportional to the average intensity, that also is the, um, related to the variance of the um, or standard deviation of the distribution of intensities. And so one of the great things about using optical disorder like this in experiments is that one can go through and actually just measure the properties of the disorder exactly. So here, many groups have done this. Here's some data from one of my graduate students' theses, Will McGeehee's thesis, where he used optical microscopy to measure a speckle field. There it is. And then he calculated for this a probability distribution of intensities. So here it is on a semi-log plot. And on this axis here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six orders of magnitude. That's the probability to find a certain intensity, where this is the intensity divided by the average. And you can see there's an exponential on there. That's a black line. And the red is what was measured. And you can see it's really pretty amazingly um, demonstrates this exponential distribution. Okay, so it's a great approximation. It's not perfect. You can see it deviates here way out on the tail. Okay, and it has to because, of course, in real life, there's a finite amount of energy going through that lens, and so you can't just find any intensity you like. All right, that's illegal in physics. So somewhere this has to roll off. All right, so distributions of this random potential, the distribution of potential energies and intensities is exponential. All right. And what's cut off here is that uh, one of my students, Will McGee, he went through and wrote up a lot of this carefully in his thesis. So if you go to uh, my group's website, you can read more about it there. OK, so now that you also want to think about a length scale, because you can see that length scale by i. So what's that length scale? Well, for a potential like this or an intensity profile like this, the thing that sensibly gives you a length scale is the intensity autocorrelation. Of course, I always trade off intensity for potential energy. They're related. So you can define an intensity-intensity autocorrelation, and that will give us a length scale. So here's a 3D volume of speckle that was measured via optical microscopy and scanning a microscope in 3D and measuring that. And you can see there's definitely characteristic length scales there. So if you take these data and you take the intensity-intensity autocorrelation, here's what you get, and it looks basically Gaussian. So along the direction of propagation, which is z, and the direction um, the transverse direction of propagation to that laser beam, x and y, you can see there's characteristic length scales present, and it's asymmetric. So this is not um, derived, but approximately from fitting these kinds of distributions, you can show that it's Gaussian, and so there's characteristic Gaussian length scales, sigma transverse and sigma longitudinal, okay? And they are determined by what we call the f number of the lens, which is the rate, ratio of the focal length of the diameter. So if you want to make very small disorder, you need to have a very small F number lens, all right, which means very short focal length, large diameter, all right, which is what makes also you know, nice camera lenses. I mean, you can afford to buy that. That's a minus sign in that exponential. Yeah, sorry, that's, yeah, these are minus signs. They didn't get formatted very well, did they? There's a tiny little gap there you can't see. Minus sign, minus sign. So a question. Yeah. Uh, why is the distribution of uh, intensity poisoned? Why is it not Gaussian? 
Like, the distribution of intensities is, is exponential. Yes. Why is that so? That is very, it's not, um, go read that book. All right, I'm going to give you the summary. I don't think directly. The short answer is the distribution of the amplitude is Gaussian. And when you square it, you get this. Isn't that true? No. No? No. Nope. So there was a great book. Go read the book. I'm going to show you speckles actually really kind of weird. Um, I want to give you the answers to things that matter. And then if you want to derive them or figure out why it is, there's a great book you can go read. It. Let's not get it. That was, you know, we're already behind on time. So lead into a very long discussion. All right, but for the purposes of this talk, it's, it's approximately a Gaussian autocorrelation, so there's well-defined sizes. Okay? All right, any questions that I will want to answer? Any questions I might not want to answer? Yeah? Um, so, the speckle, does that add photon interactions? Oh, so I maybe didn't make this very clear in my last talk. So um, when we do these kinds of experiments, we and other groups, we use laser beam wavelengths that are very far detuned from the um, atomic resonance, which means there's very little spontaneous scattering. So there's not much heating. You should just think of these as giving rise to very conservative potentials. Okay, so it's just a conservative potential that's generated that's proportional to the intensity to a very good approximation. There is some spontaneous scattering, and that's a real issue in experiments. Um, didn't have time to talk about in the last lecture. Other questions? Yeah? Is there a way to see uh, presence of modal lines? Pardon me? Modal lines? Yeah, I'll come to that in a minute. Okay. There's all kinds of weird things going on here. There's a reason it's a topic of actual research in optical physics, speckle. Okay, um, I want to tell you and warn you about something um, because you will read things in papers which are not physical. And I, if you get into this, I want you to be forewarned. So let me show you. So this, this equation here that shows the intensity autocorrelation is approximately Gaussian is really a fit, okay? It's not Gaussian. You can calculate, this is, so this is a measurement and this us and other groups have fit distributions of this measurement, and this is what you get. What if you try to calculate it? All right, what you can do, and you can read in that book, or you can calculate it. It's not hard to calculate this. So here's some limits where you can get an analytical result for some of these speckle features, and I just want to show you these results and skim over them and, and warn you about something in case you get into working on this. So let me, um, let me tell you a, a result that you can calculate the speckle autocorrelation where now you have a Gaussian input beam, so no longer uniform illumination, but it's an infinite diameter lens, okay? Because this makes it possible to calculate things. Of course, it's not physical, but you can get a result. So you get, this is what you get for the intensity autocorrelation, and I'm not gonna, there's a minus sign right there, all right? So it's kind of similar looking, it's a little bit different. Um, Here's a plot of this function. Uh, it's cut off along here. So here's the x direction. That's this direction. Here's the z direction, this direction. Yeah, it kind of looks sort of Gaussian-ish. Um, it's not really, but it's close. With sizes that are, again, now controlled by the focal length of the lens and the input beam waste. Now there's a lens of infinite diameter, so the f number doesn't come in anymore. All right, so, so anyways, what this equation is not so important. I want to show you something that goes really wrong here um, because this has gotten worked into a bunch of papers and, and there are some problems. So let me just show you something else. Something else that's really important is the Fourier transform of this intensity autocorrelation, the power spectrum, because Vibin kind of got into this a little bit. This is kind of what determines how the atoms, move when they move through this speckle potential, how they scatter and change their momentum. This power spectrum is really what determines this. So if you take the power spectrum in this approximation of the speckle, what you find is a bunch of relatively strange things, like there's a delta function in it, and if you plot it, in fact, there's no weight along the direction of propagation. And there have been many papers that have been, 